We are taught to love you, O oh God, with all of our heart. We confess that our allegiance is less than complete. We are taught to love you, O oh God, with all of our soul. We confess that we long to have our own way. We are taught to love you, O oh God, with all of our mind. We confess that our thoughts are seldom so pure. We are taught to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We confess preference for ourselves being first. God, have mercy upon us as we make our confession. Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us our sin. Gracious God, I come to you in prayer today for your children. You know them each by name, but they weigh heavy on our heart today. Father, we lift up Rachel and Sherry, who are dealing with uh, cancer and the effects of cancer. Lord, we lift up Midge, who has recently gone on hospice. We lift up Anthony, a young man uh, fighting for his life in ICU, a father of five children. Lord, watch over them and strengthen them. Lord, we lift up a doctor at Bassett and her father who are fighting the same battle with COVID. Watch over them and strengthen them as well. Lord, we lift up Lois Wright, who's recovering from uh, hip surgery. And Lord, we ask that you would be in the middle of that, that you care for that and heal her quickly. And Father, we lift up all who are dealing with the effects of this virus. Some who are fighting the disease, other who are fighting the isolation and loneliness that comes from not being able to live their lives as they would wish. Lord, they are all in desperate need of you. Some of them are questioning your love for them. Assure them that they are loved no matter what. Others are experiencing sorrow. Let them know that you grieve with them. Still others are filled with stress and anxiety. Remind them that you are sovereign over all. Finally, those who are filled with peace today, let them also be filled with gratitude to you. It is you alone who can bring such calm to our souls. Thank you for seeing each one of us as your children and for knowing them by name. Let each of them feel your tender embrace today. For we ask in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 90, a prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to seventy years or eighty, if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great 
as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Then if David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Good morning. Uh, we heard our scripture a little earlier. You, you heard what it was about. And it was actually 
the Pharisees trying to trap Jesus in an answer to a question. And we, we need to understand that this is right off the Sadducees that would try and trick Jesus into a, an answer and a question that they could sort of uh, use to attack him later on with his answer. And the Sadducees had gone, uh, they were not big believers in a, in a, in a resurrection. Uh, so the Sadducees had settled on this. They said, what if uh, a man who has three brothers marries a woman and then the brother dies? And according to tradition, the next oldest brother would marry the woman if he wasn't married. And he died. And then she married the next brother in line and he died. And finally she married the last brother and he died. On the day of resurrection, whose wife would she be? And they thought, well, we've, we've caught him. He, he's going to get stuck here. He has to answer. And Jesus said, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. There is not giving and taking in marriage. And he basically answered their question and shut them down. Immediately after this, the Pharisees figured, we'll take our shot at Jesus. And they came at him with this question. What is is the greatest commandment of all. Now I'm pretty sure they were looking for a priority in the Ten Commandments and saying, well, you're going to have to pick one and, and, and go with that. And Jesus didn't answer that way. As a matter of fact, he went with a passage of Scripture that has come to be known by most Jews as the Shema. And the Shema is the essence of the Jewish faith. The, uh, is the essence of faith in God. And Jesus said, this is the greatest command. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Some say with all your heart, soul, and mind. The, the translations are, are have very slightly, but that was love the Lord your God with everything you have. That was the essence of it. And then he said the second command. The second most important is like unto the first, love your neighbor as yourself. He said, for on these two laws hang all the laws of the prophets. If you do these two things, you'll be fine. God will be pleased. And uh, that, of course, shut down the Pharisees as well. Jesus repeated right after that, but he said, let me ask you a question. Who do you say the Messiah is? And they answered, the son of David. He said, then how is it David calls the Messiah his Lord if it was his son? How could that be? And they were silent. You see, here's the thing. The ultimate truth always trumps a partial truth. We live in a world of, of partial truth, some partial understanding. Part of it is, is a, simply a lack of knowledge. It's not an attempt to deceive. It's simply the limited understanding which we bring to the party. I believe this, that in, that in the end of time, everything that God said will be proven true. The fact that we don't have the capacity to understand it now doesn't make it untrue. The fact that we are one off in our truth because we don't understand completely the truth with the intellect of the almighty being of God does not mean that we're correct and God is wrong. It just means that we simply lack the capacity to understand. It, in, in very common terms, let me, let me put it to you this way, you don't explain things to a three-year-old the way you explain them to a 33-year-old. And there's a reason why. The three-year-old simply doesn't have the capacity to comprehend all the nuances that an adult does. In that comparison, uh, when you compare our intellect with God's, we're less than three. I mean, he is, he is very gracious and very loving and very kind. And he, he tolerates our limited understanding as long as we, we grasp what we can. We can only help be held accountable for that which we can grasp, but however, the truth of God is not 
so difficult that a child can't understand it. That's the point. So there's no excuse for denying the deity of God or the supremacy of God or the place of Jesus Christ as his only begotten son. It always comes back to that. And the, the Shema, as it's been called, is uh, the essence of the faith. As a matter of fact, when, when Jewish children are bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, that is the prayer that they learn in Hebrew. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I, I mean, every, every little Jewish kid learns that prayer in Hebrew so that he can say it in front of the rabbis. It's the essence of the faith. It's the truth of God in a nutshell. This is what's required. To love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. A famous theologian was being quizzed once, and he said, uh, what, is the, what is the essence of all the messages of the prophets and the Hebrew Bible? And he told the person who was quizzing him, this is a man with multiple doctorates, the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And they were intellects and, and uh, people of great education. And they said, what is, what is the equivalent of that for the New Testament? For our Gospels and for the Epistles? What, 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 what is the essence of that in the New Testament? And he looked at them. And he recited the words from a child's song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How simple and how profound. You see, the things of God, the most profound things in the universe, are simple enough for a small child to understand them. And yet have so many nuances that it is something we won't be able to fully understand or embrace until we are in the presence of God ourselves. But this truth remains. These principles are job one. These principles are our primary task. These principles are an ongoing uh, imperative that God himself set out, that Jesus himself reiterated and stressed again. He was asked specifically, what's the most important commandment? And he says, hey, I'm not going to mince words with you. This is it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. It's that simple. Now, we get into trouble when we decide what that looks like, because we put a lot of ourselves on that. So if you, if you really, you've heard people probably say, if you really loved God, you'd believe this. Or you'd believe this, or you'd believe this. If you really loved God, you would do this, you would do this, or you would do this. We assign behavior, we assign belief, we assign values, uh, we assign causes, and then we pull God into them. Friends, I, I just tell you this day, uh, if the only cause, if you, if you need a cause, if the only cause you have in your life is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God, you'll be fine. That's a great cause. That's enough of a cause to keep you busy for a lifetime and beyond. There are so many things in life that we, we stuff in there and, and we make provisions for and we make allowances for. The problem is that when we so pack our lives with demanding things, when we so pack our lives with demanding views, when we so pack our lives with demanding causes, the problem is we can compromise what's number one. That was Jesus' warning to the Pharisees. That was Jesus' warning to the Sadducees. He said, you're getting caught up in the minutia. You're worried about the little things. 
The Sadducees, you want to debate intellectual questions. The Pharisees, you want to count seeds and spices and make sure that you follow the letter of the law. He said, because God is not found in the letter of the law. God is not found in the intellectual argument. God is found at the heart of the law, at the core, at the center. There's a Jewish uh, saying that says, you don't follow the law, you live the law. He said, you, you, you put it into practice. You, you ingrain it into your person so that it just flows naturally from you. As long as you're trying uh, to assign parameters to it, you're going to struggle. You're truly going to struggle. And uh, some for some folks, it's tough. If you're one of those people that likes to have an agenda and you follow the agenda to the letter if you're one of those people that likes to have an itinerary when you travel and you follow the itinerary to the letter it'll be a struggle because God wants to lead you much closer than that he wants to lead in person he wants to lead you intimately where he holds you hand your hand as you choose where you're going to make your next step. He's not going to give you a map for the whole trip. So, go this week, keeping job one, job one. Keeping the main thing, the main thing. And seeking to order your life around this truth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. If you do that, you will be well served. And remember the next words out of Jesus' mouth. And love your neighbor as yourself. Two things to remember. Not 102. Not 288. Two things. And those will keep you on track. Amen. And bless you this week. May God go with you. And may the love of God be at the center of your life. Jesus exemplified the great commandment. Jesus loved God with all that he had, and he loved his neighbors, healing them, teaching them, calling them daughter and son. He loves us too, going to the cross for our sake in his death and resurrection. The love of God is poured out on the world, and we in turn are empowered to love extravagantly. Friends, believe the gospel. Jesus Christ has forgiven us. Amen.